It's a good question. Political leadership is absolutely critical to the process and we need to continue to engage constructively with every country. But at the same time, there are a number of positive developments that have happened since the agreement was adopted in 2015, and we cannot forget that. If you look at the role that cities, local and regional governments and businesses are playing, that's huge on its own. And they are strongly committed, they have stepped up, and their contribution cannot be underestimated. Secondly, we have technology on our side. If you look at renewables, the cost of options like solar and wind has dropped significantly. And in many countries, these technologies are now cost competitive with fossil fuel options. We have a better understanding of other technologies, battery storage, uh, smart grids, e-mobility. So in a way, technologically, we have different pathways to pursue. And lastly, while the political landscape is shifting in some countries, we are seeing other countries signaling their intention to do more. So some already have plans to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, and others are taking steps to increase their ambition by 2020. So overall, I think we have reasons to be optimistic, and that needs to be recognized. Well, I think it's very unfortunate whenever anyone reneges on their commitments to the Paris Agreement. There's no question about that. But regardless of what's happening at the international level, what we're seeing within countries is people turning to their courts to hold their governments accountable for their commitments to act on climate change. So in October this year, you had a Dutch Court of Appeal uphold a previous ruling of a Dutch court that ordered the Dutch government to reduce its emissions significantly by 2020. And that those sorts of cases are unrolled all over the world, including in the US. Um, and there have been successful cases in Colombia and Pakistan. So it's inevitable that regardless of what's happening at this level um, and who is a party to these negotiations, governments can expect to be held accountable for their inaction on climate change. What we need is for the world to carry on. Uh, a few outliers are problematic and they are big countries and very important countries. But what always strikes me with the Paris Agreement is the need for, to really take the science seriously, to work on 1.5. We have the new evidence from the IPCC of how much worse one, uh, 2 degrees is than the impacts at 1.5. And the world needs leadership, it needs to go ahead, it needs to reduce emissions radically and rapidly. And hopefully by the time that the US and Brazil have leaders who are willing to lead on this issue, the rest of the world will have started the transformation it needs to have made to get towards uh, limiting global warming to 1.5, to make the emissions cuts that we need and to begin to adapt to the impacts that are already ine inevitable with the warming that we're experiencing. As you know, we're already behind in terms of meeting the Paris Accords, the, the promises that countries have made. This COP is about putting out the details of exactly where we're trying to get to, sort of filling in the fine points of Paris, but there's a real question about making it happen. So I think it's going to be a combination of two things. One is going to be technology, the ability for it to happen in a way that lets countries grow and prosper. But the other inescapable need is the need for true global leadership that there is nothing that's going to make this happen without global leadership and transformational technology. And until we, I think we're going to get the technology. I'm highly confident that the human beings on this earth can come up with technology that will make it possible. But I think it's going to be absolutely necessary for voices to emerge around the globe that say, we must do this. It will make us richer. It will raise our wages. It will make us better employed and healthy. And that message has to come out across the globe and be heard in every corner of the earth. Well, at the moment, the world is not on track in terms of meeting its climate goals, but we can get there. And the key issue is to focus on seizing the moments that we, we can build on. Uh, and in this context, finance is a critical issue. Uh, finance is something that helps to enable more ambitious climate action across the world, and particularly in developing countries. Despite the state of politics in the world, there are some 
good science to ground in and build off of. For example, the multilateral development banks recently announced that between 2021 and 2025, they will give $200 billion toward climate finance, which is a pretty big step. Recently, um, four banks announced that they would align their loan portfolios that come up to something like $2.4 trillion toward climate goals. So these are good signs. At the same time, this is, there's no time for complacency. We absolutely have to see more finance from developed countries to developing countries flowing, and in particular public finance. We desperately need more adaptation finance, which was only about a quarter of public finance in 2016. Uh, so we really need to see a ramping up of climate finance in that context. At the same time, we need to align all financial flows with climate goals, which is something that the Paris Agreement, uh, it, there's a goal in the Paris agreement that does require that uh, and, and we need to figure out how we do that in 2015 373 billion dollars went to fossil fuel subsidies and we need to figure out how we shift those investments toward more sustainable alternatives uh, but pressure is there and, and you know you have to keep working on it but we can get there it's a really hard question and it's really break my heart when I I listened the first time that Bolsonaro wants to come out of Paris Agreement. But one positive thing that happened in Brazil is that civil society is getting close. We are working together with another organizations in, uh, in Brazil and in other countries to transform the world and um, save the planet because we need to act. And if our government um, doesn't want to do something, uh, the youth is ready to do it. The civil society wants to, to, to make things and to save the planet. It's a, a very uh, sad news, but we will do something to, to change this reality. We are not just equality and cry. No, this is not the youth. The youth will fight against it and we will try to involve everybody and save the planet. So we've been with this scare. For too long we have imagined that the way to solve the climate crisis is to rely on national governments to lead the way. That was always a, um, a, uh, a misunderstanding of how change happens. Um, and, and what we've seen actually since Donald Trump was elected president in the United States is that the movement of companies and corporations, um, mayors and governors have actually risen to fill the leadership back from the United States and built a layer of support for climate action that we've never seen before uh, in the U.S. So that actually, we need that regardless of who is president. Um, and actually that, more than anything else, is going to drive um, implementation of the Paris Agreement, not just in the United States, but in countries all over the world. Movements like we are still in have emerged in countries like Japan, Mexico, Argentina over the last several months, and we're going to see more of them in the years ahead. That's what's actually going to ensure that the Paris Agreement um, stays on track regardless of who leads um, countries around the world.